Good evening. My name is Matthew Hills. I am the director of the Grenfell Art Gallery and curator of the Memorial University Art Collection. I'm of settler ancestry and an uninvited guest in Mi'kmaq territory. Before we begin, I'd like to, and really it's my honor in this context, to acknowledge with gratitude that the Grenfell Gallery is in traditional Mi'kmaq territory, the Humcook. And we further acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Biotak, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this, wonderful, of this great province. It is my great pleasure to be joined by painter Nelson White in his exhibition, Tukian, Awaken. This exhibition was developed in collaboration with the Confederation Art Center, where it is headed after its closing here at the Grenfell Art Gallery. It is made possible by the support of the School of Fine Arts, Grenfell Campus, Memorial University of Newfoundland, the Canada Council for the Arts, and Arts NL, the Newfoundland and Labrador Arts Council. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Nelson. Uh, to begin, I'm going to provide a, a brief bio and a bit of background before posing some questions to Nelson and opening up for questions from the audience. Uh, to those who have already submitted questions in advance, thank you very much. Our wonderful um, assistant curator, Emily Clark, will be gathering them throughout, so please feel free to submit as, the, uh, as our discussion progresses. Um, so I'll provide a bit of a bio on Nelson before we get into the discussion component. Nelson White was born on the west coast of Tehumcook in the community of Flat Bay. Nelson is a member of the Halapu Mi'kmaq First Nations Band. He attended the visual arts program at the former Bay St. George Community College before graduating from NASCAD, the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. His paintings are included in public and private collections across North America, including the Provincial Art Collection of Newfoundland and Labrador and the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. His father, Calvin White, is a respected elder, past elder in residence at Grenfell Campus, and a significant Indigenous activist who was inducted into the Order of Canada as well as the Order of Newfoundland in recognition of his lifetime of championing the rights of Mi'kmaq in Newfoundland and Labrador. Nelson was the first Indigenous artist in residence at the Rooms Art Gallery, the Provincial Art Gallery of Newfoundland and Labrador. The body of work that constitutes Tukian Awaken is 18 painted portraits was two years in the making. So Nelson, I thought we would structure our discussion around three key paintings or sets of paintings in the exhibition that to my eye exemplify different strategies or tracks within the body of work, <laughs> uh, that the body of work that is Tokyo Awaken. So the first piece was uh, Regalia Maker by Michelle Cormier, uh, RCMP officer and designer. It's from 2019. Uh, and this one's also paired with Smoke Jumper, Calvin White Jr. Firefighter. And the work in this, generally in this exhibition portrays prominent and accomplished indigenous women and men using the conventions of traditional European portraiture to decolonize a medium painting that has often fur furthered colonial imperialism. Um, and I think you're counteracting, essentially counteracting uh, and undermining one dimensional understandings of Mi'kmaq people and their lived realities. I was wondering with Regalia, and S Regalia Maker and Smoke Jumper, I think they crystallize something that's really a current throughout Tookie and Awaken mm -hmm. around kinship and kin. Um, yeah, uh, family and kin are really important to me. Uh, my community uh, formed me. My community developed me. I'm from this land. I'm from the West Coast. So um, it was important to bring my community into my work. Um, the, the idea behind the, the series of paintings is to show indigenous people uh, not in regalia, not in uh, noble savage portraiture as people, as some people think that's how native people live. I know how native people live. I grew up with native people. So these people are my friends and my family. So someone like Michelle I've known for years who's been very active in our community. Uh, even though she was an RCMP officer, she was very active. She was a regalia maker and in charge of the powwow committee. So there's a, there was a duality there. Uh, when you see her in her red surge, uh, you don't necessarily think of her as an indigenous woman, yet she is, and she's very proud of her heritage and very proud of the work she does. And the same with my brother. My brother is, is very active. His wife is a, is, is a fabulous dancer. He's been a lead dancer at Flat Bay Pow Wow. They're very proud of their culture, and they're very proud of, of what formed them. But again, his job is he's a firefighter and he fights forest fires in big forest fire. He's, his team has been taken out of province many times to fight uh, fires in other provinces. So um, I just wanted to show that. I want to show that side of indigenous culture that we come in all forms and sizes and we do various things. 
And both, like, these are bo striking portraits in and of themselves, but both have a feather featured in the background or as part of them. Is that? <laughs> it's, it's more of a, more of a softening. Yeah. Um, the first painting in the series, um, I actually put the, the, the subject in a place. Right. And I didn't like the hard edges. I didn't like them being in a place. I didn't like the squares of windows and doors. I wanted them to be away. Um, in the portrait, the smoke jumper portrait of my brother, he's in a helicopter. So I had to put him in a place to, to some extent because yes. I wanted to show that locale. Uh, but um, the feathers and the background, I wanted to put something organic. I wanted to put something softening, something gentle, mm -hmm. as opposed to really harsh strong lines to, to, to sort of break up the composition. Yeah, and you can see they jump. There's a positivity and a color yeah. that gives it that presence. And, and that's what I was trying to do. Like, like uh, the way I paint, uh, I paint with hard, very hard edges. There's, there's dark outlines and stuff like that. And that's by choice. That's a conscious choice. Looking at other indigenous artists and looking at indigenous work, people like T.C. Cannon who painted out of Oklahoma and Novo Morso and Daphne Oje and all these people that always have painted with a dark edge. I like that and I want it to, I wanted that 3D. I wanted them to jump off the canvas and come come out of you, as opposed to some of uh, traditional 13th, 14th, 15th century portraits where they're softer and they kind of blend into the background and this dark background is going to lose them a lot. So, and that's that's like something you've developed over time through yes. this series in particular. Or uh, that no, always no, it was always it's always been my I, I I paint the way I paint. Yeah, it sort of it sort of comes to me. Um, I, I have a style. Uh, when people see my paintings, they know they're painted by me. Uh, but it's it's more of how how I began to paint and how I worked. And as I worked through stuff, learning to paint and becoming a painter, um, I found things that I liked. I found things like uh, I, I like bright colors. I like the dark outline. I like the, the the big shifts in tones. I, I like big brush works. So it's just the way I work. So. It's, it wasn't created for the series, it's just the way I've always painted. And it, it, it come, that's how I go out into the world. Because like, there, there is a really clear style to your work, but it also never overwhelms the sitter. There's a real clear sense of who the portrait, who the person is in that portrait yeah, and, I, and what they're bringing to it. I, I don't want to ever lose the person. The likeness may never be exact. Um, I don't claim to be a photorealist. I don't want to be a photorealist. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in, uh, I think you can get a lot more um, truth uh, of a person by pose, by stance, by expression, yeah. and I think, I think that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, I, I, I don't want to get all touchy-feely and say captured her essence or any of that sort of thing, but I just want to, I, I, I want you to get a sense of them, that when you walk in a room you know that that's Michelle. Yeah. Not necessarily because it looks like her, but because you know Michelle. And I think that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And there's an aspect of family and community kinship in that sort of Yeah, it, it, it's, it's yeah. because you recognize your own, you recognize your people, you recognize the nuances and the subtleties. Uh, I can have a conversation with my brothers, would probably saying four words. Yeah. But we've had a long conversation with our eyes and with hand gestures and that we know what's going on. Yeah. And that's part of family, and that's part of kinship, and that's part of, of community. And it, 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 it branches out. I can have that same conversation with people in my family and people in my community. The f further out it gets, the harder to have that conversation. Yeah. But you can. There are cues, and there are gestures, and things that were, you know. Yeah, when my brothers roll their eyes a certain way, I know they're talking about my mom. <laughs> and, you know? <laughs> Um, and like I, I've said this to you often throughout the run of the exhibition, how it's been really, mm -hmm. I, we're open by appointment now at mm -hmm. this stage and uh, we've had to really, due to COVID and the circumstances, mm -hmm. we've had to adapt to the way we operate. But having people through this space and make, coming to see your show has felt, has revived the sense of that community connection because people are coming in and, and coming into what is a colonial institution at the university and seeing the show and sort of, uh, I think, connecting a little bit more to this work in that community well, in that way. That, and, and that's why it was important to be at Grenfell first. Um, the work was created originally with Grenfell in mind. It's now going to have a life after Grenfell. But initially, when we first discussed me doing a show out here, it was important to me that uh, 
it had community, yeah. that the community were aware of it and would come see it. Um, as I, as it's clear, I'm a representational painter. I paint things that kind of look like things. Um, and I think to, uh, for my messaging and f to reach the people that I want to reach, I have to be representational. I have to be very clear. I, I don't think people are going to come and look at something a little more cerebral, a little more, uh, they won't get the messages as easily right. if, if they have to work a whole lot harder. Yep. And so I'm, I'm, I'm and I, I like paying people, that's what I do. It's, it's, I find people interesting, I find people fascinating. I like figurative work and that's what I'm drawn to, so. And I, I know you're also a music fan, so the next set of portraits or works that I mm -hmm. wanted to turn to and speak to, one in the background behind me, uh, just being me, DJ Cookham, DJ from 2019, as well as um, the um, native Gothic, the Snotty Nose Res Kids on my left, these two portraits. Um, and I think it kind of gets into a stream of activism and talking about what some artists, and particularly, think of Jeremy Dutcher prominently, mm -hmm. um, as labeled as an indigenous renaissance. And your, power, your painting has a really powerful resonance in a province where um, confederation was predicated on the erasure of indigenous personhood, mm -hmm. where there are stereotypical portrayals of indigenous men in the coats of arms of the province. Um, I think oftentimes people think of stereotypes as something that's been passe or dismissed, but mm -hmm. these are really present in everyday life to some yes. degree for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. So, yeah. Um, and when I think of the uh, DJ Cookham and Anios Rez kids, I'm not very familiar with their music, but I have, I have a sense of cultural activism and uh, thinking somewhat of the I Don't Know More movement, but also, you know. It, it, it is that, it's cultural activism. They're, they're, they're both as, both DJ Cookham as a DJ and Anios Rez kids as, as a band. They have a presence, they have a message. They're, they're talking about community, they're talking about matriarchy, they, they talk about family which are really important messages. As also, um, hip hop culture is really prevalent, especially of young, young indigenous people. Hip hop culture is, is uh, uh, it ties a lot of community together. And seeing hip hop artists portrayed as strong, intelligent beings, I th thought was an important message. DJ Kokum, I think, is a beautiful woman, and I wanted to portray that as, as someone who's strong and powerful and very comfortable in her skin and as who she is. And the same with the same with the, the Snotty Nose Res kids. They they're out there. They they they're saying who they are and unabashedly so, unabashedly native, and we're proud of it. And that's what the show is about. That these people exist in the world and they're proud of who they are and they're proud of their culture and they're proud of of uh, where they came from and what they represent, and I, I didn't want to get I, I didn't want to get lost in stereotype and get lost in in oh you're only native when you have your regalia on. Yeah. So so earlier when you're talking about your style or like the, your decisions around the way you're going to paint, you were saying you know I think that's the best way I can reach who mm -hmm. I want to reach. Who is that that you want to reach? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. I want I want people that I want people I want young native people to come in and say cool, these people exist in the world. Uh, the best compliment I had was my dad uh, said he came and saw the show and he said he was really ha proud of the show even if it wasn't his son that painted it uh, because 50 years ago when he was at the beginning of the indigenous movement he wanted these people. This is what he wanted to see. He wanted these people out in the world and they exist. And so for me that's, that's what I, I, I want people to see. It. I want settlers for lack of a better term I want people to come in and look at it and say, wow. Uh, and I also want people to question their own beliefs. Yeah. That if you come in and look and go, wow, I didn't know there was a native neurosurgeon or I didn't know there was a native fashion designer, maybe you should have conversation with yourself as to why you think these people can't be. Yeah. And so yeah. that's, that's the conversation that I want to have and I want to start. That when you come in and you look around and go, oh wow, I didn't know that the, we had RCMP officers. Well, why did you think that? Yeah. How did, why? Why would you think that? And w w what would prevent a, an indigenous person from being an RCMP officer? So that's, I, w I want, I want, um, I, what I try to do as, as a painter is let the viewer tell their own story, let the viewer f 
like these are all specific people, but you as a viewer, when you go to painting, you can write your own story. Yeah. Is, is this person mad? Is this person happy? Is this person uh, in deep in thought or, or not? And you, you come to that. And I think I'm hoping that people will make some their own decisions as well as to sort of what an indigenous person looks like and not fall into that very narrow, very, very narrow uh, powwow weekend look. So. We've had really strong reactions by the public that's come in, and we've had steady, mm. even by appointment, steady. Has there been any sort of feedback or reactions to your work? Uh, just most, or before uh, most, most of uh, it's been positive because most of the reaction I'm getting is from people I know. People have come by yeah. and sort of said, "Hey, we saw it and it was great." And um, I like being here. I was here all day, as you know, and I like the reactions of people coming in today and just having their discussions. People like like artist friends of mine that I uh, didn't realize they were oil paintings. Yeah, yeah. That you know was kind of like I didn't realize they were oil paintings. I thought they were acrylic because they're so bright and stuff. And so it just yeah, it's, it's interesting um, to have the reaction of, oh, wow, that's so-and-so, uh, as well as just having some of the technical conversations as, oh, you did it this way, and you did that, and so, yeah, it's been, the feedback has all been positive, and I'm flattered by that and happy that it's been so well received. Yeah. Um, so, we're moving quickly here, but okay. I, and I should acknowledge that you've been up since work, since seven. You had an interview this morning with CBC Radio. You were all day in the gallery taking appointments and people coming through and people being here. So um, that's okay. I don't sleep. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> sleep is, eh, sleep's overrated. Um, the, like, like to my mind, one of the key works, and I think this is the final one I wanted to discuss. Um, and I think it, it exemplifies this body of work in certain ways, and it's essentially positive and generative, but also has a strong socio-political commentary, and it's exemplified by that portrait, I would say, of Jordan Bennett. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that piece and it, give us some insight that, or background in that's, the process? That's easily the most political, I would say, politically charged yeah. piece in the exhibit. Um, when I decided to do this series of paintings, when I decided I was going to do portraiture, specific portraiture of people, Jordan was easily going to be one of the first people I did. So you had him, him in mind. Jordan, Jordan was in mind for uh, like easily like one or two as I was starting to make a list of people I was going to paint. Yeah. Jordan was, because of who Jordan is, and Jordan's an international presence, plus he's my cousin and he's a great guy, and we get along really well together. So Jordan was an easy choice. Um, also originally from Stephenville. Also originally from, he, like, yeah. he, he's, like say, we're kin, and he's from, he's from Stephenville Crossing, and, you know, we have the same aunties, and yeah. so, yeah, he's, he was formed and came out of this place. Uh, so, um, there was a show in the rooms in St. John's, uh, Future Possible, which was curated by a friend of both of ours, and front and center was Joey Smallwood's chair, and I had a reaction to it, I would yeah. say, yeah. just, just, when you walked into the gallery, it was the first thing you saw. Yeah. And um, I'm sure most people are aware, or people are not aware, the, the, the history with Joey Smallwood. Uh, my personal philosophy is that he denied indigenous identity um, as a bureaucratic, bureaucratic exercise. That it was just too complicated to, in the terms of confederation, to negotiate indigenous rights. So he just said indig indigenous people didn't exist. It was just easier for him to push through confederation without having to deal with something else. Yeah. So that was the attitude he took. So when I saw his chair, I was like, we exist, and I'm gonna put somebody in your chair that uh, was formed, developed, and became an international star in this province. Yeah. That went to school here, that grew up here, that his work speaks to here, to Newfoundland. So not only do we exist, we exist in an international scale. So uh, when I proposed the idea to Jordan, Jordan was all on board, was right away, was, okay, let's go do this. Uh, so we actually were at an event at the rooms, and we went up to actually, because I work from photographs, I work, from, I work yeah. from reference photos, we went up to take photos of Jordan in the chair, but security sort of kept us away, <laughs> and we were trying to be very stealth about it. And, yeah. uh, it didn't work out, so I took some photos of the chair, and I took photos of Jordan next to the chair for reference, and I took some other ones as well. And then I spoke to the curator after and told her, like, hey, I was getting at this chair, and she said, you know, you'd have probably broken it if you'd have sat in it, and I really didn't care at that point. Yeah. <laughs> if we'd have broken it, oh well. 
but yeah. it was more of it, it was very much of taking back that image of taking back this this throne that this man set upon the sealskin throne that he set up on the house of assembly yeah. and with a stroke of a pen decided there was no indians in newfoundland and so i wanted to put a very strong unabashedly no questions about it successful native person in his chair yes and, and keith cormier when he visited the show mm -hmm. pointed out that jordan has his status card tattooed yeah. inside his arm uh, you well, I did, jordan doesn't want to show that so i didn't yeah. cover I, that's that's, yeah. that's that's not yeah so but I like he's he's wearing he's wearing he's wearing some beadwork uh, from a friend of his. He's he's wearing a bracelet, uh, like Jordan tattoos. So I wanted him. I I wanted some and uh, specifically a lot of people are three quarter glances or turned away or some different poses. I want Jordan staring straight on at you. I wanted Jordan looking directly at you, sort of saying, "Look at me. I'm sitting here now." And yeah. that was very much intentional. That that it's called reclaiming the throne because he he took it back. And the quite frank, uh, a lot of the success coming out of Newfoundland right now, when you talk about the arts and the, our Indigenous people, there are a lot of cool things happening in the Indigenous community that are happening in Newfoundland. Like Newfoundland should be proud of. Yeah, absolutely. So so I I wanted very much to have that like. Okay, not only do we exist, but we are thriving. Yeah. So. Um, and, and it's funny you mentioned Jordan, Jordan's clothing and that because clothing is really present throughout. Like I yeah. love throughout these paintings, you get a rich sense of people's textiles Wait, and wardrobes. And yeah, I I, um, I work very closely with all my models. They're yeah. easy to work with because again, they're my friends. Yeah. Uh, but I told them to wear whatever they wanted. Uh, it was their choice in in what they wore. I want something that they feel comfortable in. Uh, I shouldn't have said that because there's a lot of people wearing black. Yeah. And painting black can get very <laughs> tedious after yeah. a little while. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted them very much in what they wear. Yeah. And I like painting um, uh, lush fabric. I like painting curves and I like painting folds and that sort of thing. So to me, that's what's interesting yeah. is, is making making that design. But very much, the, the, it was a it was a very much a collaborative effort with the work in sort of saying, okay, you wear what you want to wear. Um, many of them, most of them, I had an idea of how I wanted to pose. Yeah. Uh, some other ones, it was more collaborative that we did a few things that I wanted to do. And then like the one with Megan Masso was very much like that, that I took some photos of her and then we talked about some other things and then we changed how we, how we posed her and how we sat and how we did things like that. So it was, it was the, the models very much had a, an input. But what they wore was their choice. It was sort of like, hey, what do you want to be? Like, I know with DJ Kukum, uh, we talked, and uh, I, w I went down and actually, because they were in town for a short time, photographed her at a sound check. In St. John's. In St. John's. Yeah. And uh, she had run get her leather jacket. Like, she was, she was, she said, okay, I'll do this. Oh, I got to go with my jacket. So she'd go find a leather jacket. And she was really proud of her earrings. She said, like, we need the earrings. Yeah. We need to find these earrings when they're, they're big hoop earrings with long. Um, uh, long lace on them so yeah so she was very aware uh, as she would be as a performer very aware of costume very aware of what she was wearing yeah so yeah it was it was, it was interesting to see where other people didn't care yeah and like say in Jordan's case uh, it worked out really well because we were dressed for kind of a formal event I would have I would have made Jordan formal anyway but we were at this formal event at the rooms with yeah. the chair it worked out really well, like as as in terms of trying to to, to to get the image that I wanted to get. Well, and you can feel it in the work. Like yeah. There's that. Uh, to me, there's that synergy or those lining yeah. up. Like, yeah. It, it's it, pretty. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, I'm I'm still sad that security got in my face because I would have liked to have the actual photos of Jordan sitting in the chair. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can see why. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add before we open it up to questions uh, from Facebook? It's it's it, it, well it's it's hard uh, to basically describe the paintings. There, there are people that I know, there are people that... People have to come down and people see People have it. to come and see Come it. see Grand Come to Grand yeah. Art Gallery, make an appointment. I should, I should say we've, uh, we've only found out today that we could, uh, we're able to extend the show to oh, September great. 22nd till next Tuesday. Oh, excellent. Um, the show is headed to the Confederation Art Center, Confederation Art Gallery, Confederation Center Art Gallery yeah. in Charlottetown yep. next. So 
Um, and because they've been less impacted by COVID closures, their, their continues, exhibitions continue at pace, so we need to get it to them, because yes. we're quite excited to have yep. it, but yeah. uh, we I'm can't extend the show till the 22nd. Yeah, so I'm, 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 again, my small problems are not the world's problems, but I'm, I was very disappointed that we couldn't open in May when we wanted to, to just yeah. to have a longer run here and do something more formal in the community. Yeah, but it's, it's still, I'm just, it, like, it, like I said earlier, it was really important to me that this came here first, that it was here first and that, because uh, it is community, it is this community. Even though some of the people are from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, a lot of people are from this community or people that you recognize within this community. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's been an honor for the gallery to have it here, so. Um, so we're gonna open it up for questions from uh, our Facebook audience and. Mm -hmm. If anyone watching has questions, just write them in the comments and I'll read them out. Um, the first question we have for you, Nelson, is has the experience of creating these portraits led you to any next step that has become clear through their making? Uh, y yes. Um, I'd like to continue it on. Um, there was a number of people that I wanted to include in the series that for whatever reason, for logistics and travel, I couldn't include them. So I'd like to continue. Um, I'd like to continue the series on with a few other people, but I, I do see this as a closed work. I do see this as finished. Um, my next step, in fact, my next series, uh, I'm really thinking about doing work with family, uh, not just my family, but family in the bigger context, whether they be healing circles or groups or uh, just just that wide open definition of family. So I'm interested in doing some more. Uh, bigger pieces with a lot more people in them, but it's, it's still an extension of this. I'm still always going to be interested in exploring the idea of identity mm -hmm. and exploring family and people, and uh, that's what I'm drawn to. Cool. That's a good lead into the next question. Have you always worked in portraiture? Uh, sort of. Uh, I've, I've, I mean, I was, I've always been interested in people. I've always been interested in, in faces and bodies. Uh, as opposed to landscape or still life or anything else. Uh, so I'm, I've always worked with people in some form or another. I wouldn't call it classic portraiture. I wouldn't even call this classic portraiture. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in um, expressions and movement and folds and clothing and fabric and, and that's where I find joy in painting. Painting for me is a joy. Painting for me is uh, a relaxation, the world goes away. I have a physical need to paint. I have to paint. You do it daily. I do it every day. I paint every day. Um, I've said many times I equate it to going to the gym. I feel wrong if I don't paint. So um, the work, a lot of times, right now I don't have any big plans. Uh, for the last two years I was planning this show. Right now I have no plans for a show anywhere else after this, but I'm still going to paint and it's still gonna be people, and it's still gonna be portraiture in some sense. Can you talk a little bit about the Smithsonian acquisition? The, the Sm sure. Yeah, the, <laughs> that's a, I, that is a international level of collection, and to have a work acquired, from a curator's perspective, to have a work acquired into a collection in perpetuity, it's a permanent thing that that institution mm -hmm. will preserve um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's, and Smithsonian is the National Institution of the United States, it's uh, the Museum of the American Indian, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So can you talk? That's an incredible acquisition and a real <laughs> distinction for your painting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was. It, it was uh, flattering, and um, uh, I guess uh, I was surprised how easy it happened. That was the biggest surprise of, of all of it. Yeah. That. Uh, um, as I've said in the past, when people have asked about it, um, I made contact with the Smithsonian because of someone else. Someone, uh, I had this painting that had a life that had been shown. It was actually shortlisted for a figure works prize nationally. And then it was at a show at Eastern Edge uh, last year as part of the Penobin Indigenous. So, so it, had, it had its life and I didn't want it just to live in the basement, especially given the story of Elder Oakley and who he was. Yeah. I didn't want it just to be tossed in the pile. So I was looking for a home for it. So I knew of a gallery that was interested in some of my work. So I contacted them and they sort of said, uh, Smithsonian might be interested in this. And I sort of said, 
okay. <laughs> uh, so I emailed the Smithsonian, and they were. And it happened really easily. I was shocked at how easily it happened now. Uh, the acquisition committee were interested and asked me to put together a proposal, sort of basically about the work and its history and uh, Elder Oakley and where it came from and yeah. its, its provenance. Um, I sent that to the acquisition committee. The acquisitions committee said, yes, we love it. We're going to send it off to the director of the institution. He said, yes, we'll send it to the board. They said, yes. And so it was all the steps along the way I kept expecting at any time for them to say no, but it just, it just was extremely easy. Um, I think a, a lot of it has to do with Elder Oakley. It has to do with the story. And the, it's one of those paintings, uh, when, when, we, when you know a painting works, you know it works. Uh, it's one of those paintings you can read a lot into his face. Yeah. Whatever your beliefs are about military service, about war, about, you can take it to that painting, pro and con. Uh, so I think, I think that's why the image is strong. So I think that's why they 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 were interested in acquiring it. Um, I'm I'm just happy, like you said, that it has a life, that it has, that it's gone on, and it's going to be somewhere permanently. I keep having visions of Indiana Jones that it, I, I I had to build a wooden crate to ship it to them. It had to be shipped in a wooden crate. Yeah. So I built a wooden crate and shipped it down there. So I have visions of it being like forklifted and going down the end of this never-ending warehouse and making a turn and <laughs> never, and never, and never being seen again. Yeah. And to me, that's, that's almost as exciting as, as, as a painting being hung somewhere that it's, it's in the Smithsonian with Archie Bunker's chair. <laughs> you said, you, said uh, you knew it was good. Like, is there a point when you're making a painting that it sings and uh, you know it's, um, is it only after you're done? Or is it, it's uh, uh, the way I paint, um, I have a process where I have an idea which I'm really excited about I start it and I'm excited about it. Uh, then I'm not so excited about it. Then it's terrible. Then I can't live with it. Then I can sort of say, okay, I can work through this and fix it. And then I, then I go, okay, I can live with this. I'm, I'm good with this. Yeah. And when I'm good with this, I stop. I, I've gotten very good over years of knowing when to stop. And we talked about this earlier. A lot of painters, that's a hard thing to do, yeah. knowing when to stop. And so I've gotten really good at that point of sort of saying, okay, I'm done with this. Uh, but some images, even in the show, some images are stronger than others. It's just a nature of painting. Some images, some people will resonate better, will speak better. The color choice, the yeah. palette, some are just going to be a stronger image. And that just happened to be, I thought, was a strong image. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Are there any other questions, Emily? Um, there is one more. Is there any one thing in particular that you hope viewers take away from seeing the exhibition? Uh, one thing is, is what we sort of talked about earlier is that uh, indigenous people come in all shapes and sizes. We're not one thing. We're not a cliche. We're not uh, something that's rolled out on Powwow Weekend or whatever stereotype you have, that we are uh, a living, breathing people with a variety of interests and a variety of looks and expressions, and that's what I want people to come away with. I want people to understand that uh, we're a large cross-section of, of the population, and that we've been here a long, long, long time, mm -hmm. and that you know we're we're not going anywhere. So you might as well get used to seeing us in all sorts of incarnations. Um, so unless there are any other questions from the audience, I think we're going to wrap it up. I thank, sure. thank you for your generosity of time, and it's just been an incredible thing to have this show here and to present this exhibition. And I, I, I want to thank you, and I want to thank Grenfell Gallery, and I want to thank Emily and the staff. It's been a pleasure to work with you guys. It's been very easy. I like easy. As I said with Smithsonian, it was easy. I like when things are easy, and it's been just, and given the circumstances of COVID and how the world works right now, yeah. this could have been really difficult. It could have been just very easy for you guys to pull the plug and say, we're not doing it. Um, and you guys didn't. You, you sort of all along said it was important and you wanted to show it. And I'm, I'm flattered and honored by that. Well, we're, we're looking forward to working with the Confederation Center on uh, publication, developing a publication for this exhibition. And I also, while we're talking about easy, I do want to say that you can easily book 
uh, appointments to come see the exhibition sure. through our website, through any of our social media platforms, or by emailing the gallery directly at gallery at grenfell.mun.ca. And the exhibition is up until uh, Tuesday, September 22nd, before it travels on to Charlottetown and out into the world for uh, yeah. everyone to see. So, yeah, I'm excited for traveling, and hopefully it'll come home at some point, and then we'll figure out what happens to all these paintings. I was happy to get them out of my basement. I was very yeah. excited to have my studio space back. Your work must be going into a lot of collections at this stage. My work, my work yeah. is uh, going into collections. That's yeah. um, I'm pleased by that fact that uh, I've been added to a few permanent collections from yeah. some institutions, and hopefully there's a few more things happening in the next little while. And personal and private collections personal. as well. And yeah. Yeah. So. And if people want to see more of your work, where, where can they find it? Um, my Instagram page, Nelson White Art, or my uh, website, NelsonWhiteArt.com. Um, so you'll, you can see more of my work and, and just find me there. E easy to reach out. I'm, 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 I don't want to say the word savvy, but I use social media so people can reach out and talk to me. And I'm, yeah, I'm, on Twitter and Instagram. On Twitter and Instagram. On Twitter, yeah. And Twitter and Instagram so people can reach out and talk to me and yeah. very, uh, very easy to contact. So. Thank you. Awesome. Again, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's so awesome to have you here. And thanks for your generosity of time all day. It's been a long day for you. So thank you. Yeah, my sore is getting sore. I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting better. Yeah. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, today on Facebook Live. And um, I don't need to say it, but the video will be up on Facebook Live if you want to watch uh, this interview again. So. Okay, thanks. Thanks.